The afternoon is mostly about capital, and I guess I'm in the middle of the capital sandwich. I think we've got three sections on capital. And it's interesting because we went from a market system that seemed to re rebound from shocks pretty well, seemed to absorb them like long-term capital or Russia or the tech bust, and seemed to absorb them and move on pretty well. Up until a couple years ago, when all of a sudden the system seemed very brittle. And uh, I think as uh, John Hennessy said this morning, you poked it with one nasty shock, all of a sudden the system became uh, uh, a very brittle and unstable equilibrium. So capital is a key element to make it more resilient, but I want to talk about more than just sizing the capital. I want to talk about the forms of capital and how this discussion bleeds into the issue of how do you resolve a big bank? How do you make a, a big bank not too big to fail? So first I'd like to talk about the Swiss approach to sizing capital and the format of capital and then generalize this a little bit. So we've just heard David talk a little bit about how do you size capital. And we've, we've gone through a pretty big change from Basel II to Basel III. And it's, uh, as the previous speaker pointed out, it's not just in the number, the, the ratio that's required, but also the yardstick has changed. The Basel III calculations are probably net-net 50 to 100 percent tougher than Basel II, and the ratio required is also about 50 to 100 percent tougher. So somewhere between 3 and 4x what the old system required. Now some might argue that's enough. In Switzerland, uh, Switzerland as a small country with a large banking sector decided it wanted to move early in this. They decided to actually go to a very different place or a significantly higher place than the Basel III rules. And so where Basel III requires a 7% level of capital, uh, particularly if you look at the top of that chart, uh, I, I actually was curious as to whether they saw David Miles' paper before it came out or um, if there were any discussions along that point, but they came up with a number of 10% for core regular common, tangible common, and another 9% of something called contingent capital. So the total capital in the Swiss system for the two big banks, and this only applies to the two big ones, not the smaller ones or the state ones, is 19%, a pretty different place. So the next question you might be asking is, well, what is this? I think we understand what common equity looks like. And we've had a number of discussions about how you size common equity. But what does this 9% of COCOs mean? What are these things? Now, some would say these are kind of complicated, but they're actually pretty darn simple. Contingent capital or COCOs are bonds that pay a regular coupon, we'll call it 8%, and they pay off differently depending on the state of the, state of the bank during its life. In normal conditions, they keep paying like a bond and they pay you at par. In a highly stressed condition, they turn into equity. Stressed in Switzerland is defined, actually, there's, a, there's two different flavors. There's what we call a high strike and a low strike trigger. Uh, the high strike trigger here is a 7% ratio. So if we, in the Swiss context, drop below the 7% level that's set on Basel III, these turn, in, these turn from bonds into equity. So you can think of this almost as a pre-placed rights issue. There's a couple of important features when you think about this sort of capital. First of all, from, from my standpoint, working at a bank, they're cheaper than straight equity. This is not something that absorbs losses from dollar one or has all the information requirements of equity. This is something that should turn into equity only in very remote circumstances. So it's susceptible to credit type analysis, uh, and it, so it should be cheaper than straight equity. These turn, into cap these turn into equity on a going concern basis, and unlike the hybrids that did not work in the last crisis, these, these provide loss absorption on a going concern basis, which I think is critical. These in the Swiss system would have significant size. The high strike layer is 3% of RWA, and there's an additional 6% slug of low strike cocos. So if we drop down to the 7% level, the trigger of the cocoa would knock you back up to 10%. If we then eat through that and trigger the low strike cocos at 5%, a 6% layer comes in and we kick back up to 
there are also some important incentivization issues associated with this. A number of people have said that one of the problems during the crisis was that CEOs did not act early enough to raise capital. And in this case, from, uh, as someone who used to work in the executive board, the threat of this kind of trigger will incentivize significant early action by management. So where you might have been able to say, maybe I can steer through this, maybe I can delay a capital raising, maybe I don't have to dilute. You don't want this dilution to happen to cap your base, and you will want to move early in a crisis. And I think that incentivization to raise capital early in a crisis is very important. Now, there are a couple of potential criticisms of this tool. First is that it's somehow complicated. Uh, and I don't really think it is. Certainly in an academic environment, I don't think it would qualify as all that complicated. Second is, if these things trigger, do they somehow provide a destabilizing market signal? And I would argue that that is, if you will, the mirror image of the incentivization that it, applies, it pushes a management team to go through. That you're going to be very incentivized to try and raise money earlier. I think that's, in a sense, a good trade-off to get for the risk that you might fail in raising money early. And you're also backed up by the fact this turns into a significant amount, not a thin amount, but a significant amount of hard equity. And the third criticism is that this is a nice idea. This was just an academic idea a few years ago, but it's not really that practical. You can't really raise significant money in this uh, dimension. It's not really going to change the kind of trillion dollars here or there numbers that we've been talking about today. So a couple months ago, we decided to be the, if you will, the first big bank in these waters and to test this. Let's see. Actually, this is going the other way. There we go. We um, placed $8 billion of cocos with investors in about a week. We placed two tranches with strategic investors, investors that had previously invested with us in the crisis. And actually didn't mind getting equity at a low point. They kind of thought this was actually not a bad way to invest if it automatically turns into stock at, at a market low. But some people said, well, that's great that they were able to solve half of their Swiss cocoa requirement with these special investors, but that doesn't apply to everybody else. Maybe this is just a very niche market. And so we did a public offering, a $2 billion deal that, um, I would say it was a very interesting experience because the, literally the week before, we would have questions at investor meetings from people who say, you can't possibly sell a size of this to anything other than very special investors. Debt investors won't do this. You can't have fixed income upside and equity downside. That dog won't hunt. When we actually offered this deal, we ended up with more than 10 times oversubscription from all kinds of different investors from all parts of the world. Now, we thought we'd done our homework before. We thought we knew we could place this. But you're always a little nervous when you get those kind of criticisms before. And I think the actual fact of testing these waters uh, showed that this is a legitimate asset class and this can really work. This kind of oversubscription is something you just don't get in the debt capital markets. That's something you sometimes see in the hot tech IPO. You never see that in debt capital markets. So this was a very successful deal. And the deal is now trading around 103, 104, a uh, little over 7% yield. So I think this is something that can grow into a significant component of solving the capital part of what we're trying to get to by having a buffer amount of capital that can turn into equity when we need it. But as the uh, great economist Arlo Guthrie once said, that's actually not what I came here to talk about. I came here to talk about any too big to fail. And turning this idea into something that's potentially a little bit bigger, turning into something uh, that I call Balin. And it's sort of morphing the idea of Cocos and the idea of a Chapter 11 into something that hopefully is more powerful, more efficient, and more effective. Too big to fail or resolution reform is important. And you don't have to take my word for it. There are some relatively more important people up on the screen here who also think that if you think about all the different issues through this crisis, that this is central. That if you get this right, a lot of the other issues will fall away. But if you can't solve this, 
you're locked in a lot of very difficult trade-offs and a lot of very challenging issues. I think bail-in, if implemented right, would not have solved everything in the financial crisis. It would not have solved the, some of the mortgage issues, et cetera. But I think it would have taken the back half of the crisis when we went into sort of a financial systemic shock. I think it would have taken that off the table. And more importantly, it would have taken off the table some of the potentially worst consequences that could have occurred if we didn't have the kind of uh, government support and government intervention that the Fed and other supervisors brought to bear. So if resolution reform is a good idea, well, why is it so hard? So the problem is that there are two tricky aspects to this. Getting one of these two goals right is easy. Getting both of them right is hard. So can you resolve a, system, a large international bank without risking public capital and without risking financial collapse? Again, doing one of those is easy. Doing both, that's harder. And in doing that, you've got to ask yourself a few particular questions. Do you care about making banks pay the price for getting into this mess? Or do you actually want to solve this problem in an efficient way? What actually is necessary, and, and Eric talked about this a little bit, what is actually necessary to avoid contagion? Importantly, how will markets react? Markets are not a static thing that you can operate on as a cold, settled set of facts. They adapt. So is the solution stable? Can we deal with international issues is critically important? And how hard is it to get there from here? Now, those are not easy elements. But I think even if we get to less bad than we were last time, it could be transformative in terms of how the financial system works. So what are the options for this? Uh, I'd say if you were looking at the the options that policymakers had at the start of the crisis, they were the two at the top of the page here, which are lousy options. Hank Paulson basically said at the, on the weekend of Lehman Brothers, we're not putting tax money into Lehman Brothers. And we're working very hard to find other answers to this problem. But between tax dollars and bankruptcy, those were really the only cards he had control over. And so we've talked about a number of different other possibilities, for example, Bridge banks seizing a bank and forcing it through orderly liquidation. And you do wonder about the externalities of liquidating large institutions in the middle of a crisis. Is that going to be itself making the crisis worse? Some people have said, well, too big to fail. Yeah, I got the answer right there. How about making them smaller? But I'm not sure that small enough to fail really works that great either. It's an interesting tidbit of history. Um, in the 30s, one of the congressional reports that came out about the reason we we're having all the bank runs was they were all too small and too local. And they recommended we should make these banks bigger. Seems kind of weird now, but that was kind of the core recommendation of one particular commission. Narrow banking or Volcker rule has been another proposal that somehow if we separate out deposits from risky transactions, we'll solve the problem. But I'd say there are a number of institutions that failed just by old traditional banking. Resolution funds have, been, have gotten some traction in Europe. But I'd argue that that's actually also got some, if you think about how will markets react, some bad elements in that you do not want to be the second one to fail. If the first guy actually soaks up the resolution fund, the second guy in doesn't have a whole lot to go on. And I think you get some bad game theory kind of reactions to that. So now we're at the, the two that I tend to have the most interest in. The first one is COCOs, and we've talked a little bit about that. But one of the tricky things when we were first starting to think about these instruments that have been written about in academia and how would they actually apply in a real situation was, how do you size them ex ante? How big a COCO would you have needed to save Bayer or Lehman? How would you, would you have known the right number in 2004 and 2005? It's a very tough problem. So one way out of that problem is something we call bail-in, which is to basically make the whole debt structure, the whole unsecured uh, debt structure of a large financial institution susceptible to conversion to equity. And that's actually a lot like what we do in Chapter 11, but it's adapted to banks. It's a fast-track version of Chapter 11, plus a number of supporting measures. <clears throat> 
So let me give you an example of what that might actually look like uh, in a particular example. One of the problems at Lehman was that no one believed the asset values. And there was a lot of criticism about their toxic assets, uh, something they called SpinCo. And we had a number of people, uh, I was down at the Fed that week, and we had a number of teams who actually went in to look at those assets and try and get a rough range of value. And different teams came back with different estimates, but about 25 billion was a pretty central estimate in terms of how much different was the stated mark versus the actual. So you could have marked those down and people might have said, yes, you solved the asset problems. I believe the asset value of Lehman Brothers now, but you've got one problem. Now you have no equity left. They had about 25 billion of equity. If you write off 25 billion of assets, double entry accounting means you also lose your equity. So we'd need to recapitalize Lehman and would propose to do it as per the following, where you take the subordinated instruments, convert those into equity, now, you could have stopped there. You could say, well, you've now got a hard asset base and just as much equity as before. That should be enough. But to stretch the point a little bit and to get, I think, over some of the credibility issues you have within, when an institution has gone through this, we've said, let's take a small slice of senior debt to move the equity level up further, up to $43 billion. So we now have something like a 20-plus percent capital ratio arguably the best capitalized bank in the country at this point. Like in most Chapter 11s, would also remove top management. And importantly, I think you'd also need to walk out on Monday morning with a strong liquidity plan. There are some people that say, well, if you've recapitalized, money should naturally flow through it. That academically, you would say that uh, a well-capitalized institution should attract funding. I think that's true in peacetime. If you're in the middle of a run, you, I think you need to do something specific to halt that, and I think a strong, specific liquidity plan would be essential. But I think if you did this, you'd get a number of benefits. You'd have a well-capitalized Lehman Brothers. It'd be a going concern entity. It would not impact customers or counterparties. Um, and uh, you wouldn't have to put any government capital at risk. So this is not a bailout. What kind of impact would this have on the system? Well, let's, unfortunately, we, have, um, we don't have many examples of what happens when we put a big financial institution into bankruptcy, but we do have one now, unfortunately. And so let's look at what the different classes of investors would have seen and what the impacts on others would be. Let's first start with customers. In the actual Lehman event, there were tremendous losses. And that incentivized other customers and other counterparties to run from other financial firms that they perceived to be next in harm's way. And this was not an irrational panic. This was a rational panic. If you were at another bank that was perceived to be next in line or next to that bank, as a customer, it was better to get out of the way. So you start to see runs accelerating at this time. In our bail-in example, we have not inflicted any loss on that customer base. And I think that will be calming as opposed to accelerating of runs. If you look at uh, the, top bar, the top box, you'll see that what happens to the capital structure. Everybody's actually better off in this version than they are in the actual liquidation because you preserve going concern value. Now, normally, the, the group that tends to protest about this the most are senior debt holders. They said, well, you, you protected all those customers, and they formally rank equal to me in bankruptcy. Why you, would you do that? Why can't I get their deal where I protect it 100%? Or why won't you give them the same haircut as you give me? And that's really to preserve the franchise that provides the value to the senior bondholders. That they end up, although it may be, quote, unfair, it's better for the world to be rich, to be unfair, and for them to be rich, than for it to be fair and for them to have pennies on the dollar. Senior debt is currently trading in the low 20s on Lehman Brothers and traded as low as eight to nine cents on the dollar right after the collapse. I think in this structure, the senior bondholders would get something that today would be worth something like par, actually probably worth a premium to par, given the recovery in financial assets. One last point on this page. In terms of the impact to the markets, in the actual Lehman case, you saw a tremendous amount of force selling into already fragile markets, and that further destabilized prices and put further shocks on the system. 
So in addition to the runs that it tended to cause, you also had big pressure on asset markets. Here, what we've done is we put equity at the place where we actually need it the most, at the point of distress. And we haven't had to liquidate assets. You can solve, you can solve insolvency through both the numerator and denominator, and we're solving it through more equity as opposed to forced selling of assets. And I think that would have a significant impact on markets. Now, bank resolution is not trivial. There is a reason why we haven't had an easy system for bank resolutions to date. Um, this is a list of what I would say are the toughest questions that people have come up with about any resolution system for banks, and particularly for bail-in. And I won't go through these point by point, uh, except to note it's a serious to-do list, but it's solvable. I think each one of these has an answer, and it's finite. If you look at people who've tried to get international bankruptcy codes harmonized, those people have been trying to climb that mountain for a decade or two now. And that does not look like a very easy or climbable hill. I think this is very much a, a much more easily climbable hill. In terms of where this is headed, um, I think it has gradually picked up support as people have thought through some of the benefits this brings and the, the relative lack of trade-offs that it has versus other solutions. I'd say a number of regulators, particularly in Europe, have become interested in this, which is interesting because Europe is normally thought of having more socialist tendencies. But after watching what happened in Ireland, where the cost of bailing out banks actually bankrupted a whole country, I think that was a very interesting lesson in Europe. There also are, uh, as someone once pointed out to me, a whole lot more countries in Europe than here in the United States. Uh, so the international cross-border aspects are pretty important over there. And Balin can get at those, I think, a lot more easily than some of the other solutions. And that's been another important attraction in Europe. Strangely, and this has taken a long time, and it's certainly not unanimous, but we have generally gotten the financial community to support this idea now. This is not an easy thing. Uh, a number of people are afraid this will raise the cost of funding, uh, that this will put a lot of pressure on their institution. But I think, broadly speaking, uh, the, the industry has now said, this is a reasonable idea. It's a credible idea. It's a workable idea. It may be a better solution than a lot of the alternatives that are now facing us as fundamental reforms. So just to summarize, I think Balin does give you a lot more benefits that are relatively cost free. It's, not, it's certainly not a free lunch, but I think the benefits are serious and they cut across a number of dimensions. It avoids government taxpayer capital being put at risk. It takes advantage of a very convenient fact. The, the structure of bank capital for the GCIPs has huge amounts of unsecured capital. And that, that pool of capital is measured in the multiples of trillions and could handle crises much bigger than 2008. One example for our own bank, we run a pretty high uh, Basel II ratio right now. Uh, it's on the order of 14, 15%. If you look at our total capital ratio, that gets up to 20% or so, which includes our sub debt. If you bailed in our senior debt, that would give us, if you will, a pro forma capital ratio of about 80%. So it goes well beyond, I think, even the far right of of David's chart in terms of the potential capital you could bring to bear on a problem. I think it has an important impact in terms of reducing systemic risk because you keep these as going concerns. You don't withdraw these functions from society. So you don't have the substitutability issue that Eric mentioned before. I think it, it dampens the incentives to run. And although it does affect debt investors, um, it the financial outcomes are much better. And for example, in the case of the reserve fund, it would not have broken the buck if they had gotten a bail-in instead of a, of a bankruptcy. And lastly, I think it does improve outcomes through the real economy. And it relies on market signals, which I think put moral, <coughs> put moral hazard back into the system, which I think will help make this a much more durable reform. So 
That's the end of my prepared remarks. Um, be happy to answer any questions at this point. Hi. In order for this, in order for bail-in debt to be attractive to the firm, it has to be tax interest paid has to remain tax deductible. Could you answer the technical question? Do you know under either GAAP or RS standards what conditions have to be met in order for interest to remain tax deductible if the debt can be converted to equity? It, and this, yeah. I, m this is a, an important question for both COCOs and for Balin. In Europe, generally speaking, COCOs there are a number of different jurisdictions, but in Switzerland and a number of other jurisdictions, uh, because of the, the predominant debt-like features in most environments, they're deductible. In this country, that's a harder analysis because of certain features of the tax code. Bail-in debt, I believe, gets a pretty good run uh, in, on both sides of the Atlantic. That um, I believe the US analysis is pretty clean on whether senior debt is deductible here uh, because it's much more like Chapter 11. It's not. It's not something that's convertible by its terms. It's something that happens in a resolution, just like a Chapter 11. And normal corporate debt here is pretty simple to analyze. So I think on the Balin side, it's actually pretty easy. Actually, my question is very related to that. So how would you conceptually think, and how does the European tax code, I was always, nobody gave me an answer, and you might know, think about the, where the line is between debt and equity. In the US, obviously, creditors right is fundamentally part of the definition of what makes debt debt. Uh, and so I just wonder in the spectrum between uh, debt and equity that uh, COCOs lie, exactly how do different countries in Europe think about this, or how, how would you think about it conceptually even? Because there's kind of higher yield, presumably, to pay for the systemic risk that the owners, the holders bear, and so it becomes more and more equity depending on the terms from being immediately capitalized to a, a immediately convertible into convertible with probability in zero. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not a tax theorist. Um, I don't know if there are such things, but I, I'm not one of them. Um, but clearly what you're talking about here is a sort of spectrum of instruments from pure debt all the way to regular equity. And there's a, some point at which a COCO could bleed into an equity concept. Um, I believe the analysis rests on how likely it is, how remote the triggers are. Um, I think that's how that line is drawn, but there is a continuum and a number of different features that I think probably drive that analysis, but it, that's not my expertise. But you know, actually that raises a question specifically about the point of conversion, because at that point all of a sudden the tax yield is lost, so there's a little discontinuity there on the tax front uh, that whatever that does uh, to the yeah. ex ante pricing of it or whatever. Well, that, that also happens in regular upside convertible bonds, that when those convert, they go from debt to equity. Uh, I would say that the loss of tax yield for a bank in a crisis like that uh, would be the least of our problems. Would you anticipate this being, uh, from a, a credit default swap standpoint, would this trigger a restructuring event for, the, for a bank that went through this? The, um, it's an important question because there, in the technical CDS industry, there's been some discussion about whether this would or would not, and it depends on whether you have a contractual or a statutory regime. I think that what you would want to have ultimately is CDS contracts. If we went to a world like this, that would trigger based on this kind of restructuring. That if, if you wanted to protect yourself against this type of restructuring, and this was the main way that you might resolve a bank, that you would want to have CDS contracts that worked off of that. Um, but uh, that's something that existing contracts, um, there are some technical differences depending on exactly how you implement this legally. Thanks. Yeah, the comparison between bail-in and, and bankruptcy is interesting, and certainly on the slides looks like it would work. I imagine there are a lot of details. But what about the question, you're going to now turn um, creditors into shareholders. That's going to have an effect on them. Have you done any analysis that would get any handle on the knock-on or contagion effect that even bail-in would have, you know, meaning we may be back into bail-out? We have. Um, what, one of the challenges has been in Europe, people have said, oh, well, banks are all very interconnected, so if you do this to one bank, the ripple effects will go all the way through all your financial system. Um, that's actually not true as, 
at least for the bank I know particularly well, our bank, and for most of the other banks that I've looked at, because of the nature of what you're converting. Uh, most banks have a lot of trading relationships with each other. We have derivatives hedging activities with each other. We don't tend to buy large amounts of each other's long-term debt. Um, that's a very small portion of either our assets or our liabilities. Uh, so if an event like this happened to us, uh, if, if, for example, Lehman had happened this way, and I, I was chief risk officer at the time, that would have been something you would have noticed on the trading desk, but it would have been a, a blip in terms of what else was going on. It would not have been a systemic issue. I can't speak to every bank in Europe or this country, but I think it's actually, for most, for most of the large banks, not a particularly big uh, source of contagion. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is, well, forget about banks for a moment. Is it a source of contagion elsewhere? Um, I would argue that whenever you have losses, somebody's got to bear them. And the question is, can you minimize those losses and distribute those ex ante to the people who are best able to analyze and bear them? Uh, in the actual crisis, we saw some governments come in and try and bail out their banks and then go bankrupt themselves as a government in Ireland. That was clearly not a, a good solution. I think in this case, you're talking about long-term creditors who are supposed to be in the business of evaluating credit risk. And we've reduced the amount of hit that they need to take. So I think it should be very absorbable. OK, thanks. So um, I understand that uh, one of the things this obviously does is it puts uh, people who hold derivatives contracts with the institutions uh, ahead of the, uh, uh, the bondholders. Uh, beyond that, um, what is there about this that makes it a reorganization plan for the for a financial institution rather than just a reorganization plan that you might also apply to uh, an industrial corporation? You know, the, uh, I think the analogy to an industrial reorganization is an important one. It's one of the things that was very helpful in terms of how to think about the game theory of investors as you enter this and about how you might um, divide up the different classes. <clears throat> and what was helpful is thinking about what are the things that are the business of banking trading, settlements, risk management, uh, provision of loans, deposits, versus, if you will, the unsecured funding base of a bank, equity, sub-debt, and senior unsecured debt, and separating those. The bankruptcy code doesn't, uh, doesn't do that in the same way. But because banks deal with money, it is a much, um, compare us, for example, to a mining company. With a mining company, you know what the assets are, they aren't subject to confidence runs. They're going to be there while you restructure your liabilities. With a bank, the business itself is money. So you've got to be careful not to haircut the business at the same time as you're recapitalizing. Uh, I don't know if that's a helpful way to answer the question, but the analogy was very much to try and preserve the value of the franchise as much as you can to not haircut those activities and to simply use the capital base as a source of recapitalization. Does that answer your question, or? It certainly get, gets at it. So, it's, so it sounds like, in terms of, uh, you're not recommending this for an industrial, for, you know, as, as the reorganization scheme to be applied to industrial firms because you think? Well, industrial firms already have a Chapter 11 system that works. It's one of the great things about this country is I think it does we do have a much better way for firms to fail in an orderly way. And when a big telecom firm or energy firm fails, it is not something that is gigantic block letters that sends the markets into a tailspin. It's a terrible day for that firm. Um, but it is not a crisis. Financials, when that happens, it is. So I think we need to take some of the ideas that we use in Chapter 11 for industrial companies and see what do we need to do to change those so they actually work for banks. One brief question to the Balian regime. You showed us the potential benefits, and you already mentioned yourself that there's no free lunch. So I was thinking about, did you have any thoughts about what kind of, uh, let's say, adverse uh, side effects or adverse incentives come with this regime, and whether we should take into account some complementary measures sh which should be taken within this kind of a regime? Uh, my, an example would be, for example, the remuneration schemes. So if the bank is, after the bail-in regime, well recapitalized, uh, 
the management will pay out bonuses uh, because they were doing so great jobs. So, sorry, I, I, miss, I missed that last part. So if, <laughs> if okay, so because I, actually I, I do think, for example, things like the whole compensation discussion, to me that gained legitimacy when the taxpayer was paying for the downside. That changed the nature and the philosophical basis of the discussion. If managers have their pay tied up in shares that are subject to this, that can get wiped out in a bail-in, if it is a free market enterprise and if we've returned banks to the free market, then I think the subject of compensation becomes less toxic because it's not us as taxpayers supporting somebody else's paycheck. It's them dealing with both the ups and the downs of their own institution. Well, this was just one example which just comes into mind when thinking about some mm -hmm. adverse incentives which may, might come with a bail-in regime. Maybe yeah. this example is not a problem at all because there's the market will, will then uh, uh, kick, out, kick out these kind of management. Yeah. But just some, I what guess kind the of incentives are, are within this kind of yeah. regime? So, so some of the other things that people have come up, I'd say if I was talking to uh, a group of investors, uh, some people have said, you know, look, I'm an insurance company. I represent millions of ordinary people. You can't do, give a haircut to senior bank that that's supposed to be one of our really safe assets. Um, and they would argue, wait a minute, I'm not so different from a taxpayer. Uh, we both represent millions of people. Why are you inflicting this kind of pain on me? I really should be protected. And I'd argue, if you want to be protected, you should buy government debt. You shouldn't buy a private corporation. If I was speaking to a banking audience, a number of them are worried about, will my costs go up? How much will this really cost? Um, I'd argue that for well-run institutions in good countries, this should not cost that much. It'll cost something. Um, you know, to some of David's comments before, there, I think investors, like rating agencies, think about there being a sovereign uplift. And if we get government out of the bailout business, there's some cost and some institutions are worried about how much will that be. And if you're a weaker institution, that cost will be more. Um, so for those people, it's probably not such a great thing. On the other hand, I think we want to incentivize those people to get more equity um, or to merge with a better person or come up with a business model that works um, rather than have them limp along in the hope that they'll be protected by the government. So. Uh, I have a political economy question for you. Uh -oh. So I'd like, you know, I, I was fascinated with what you said from the following perspective, that given that there's some implicit guarantee for credit, credit suisse, why would you take an action to reduce a government subsidy? Or to put this question more generally, no American investment bank has, has, has taken this action, and for, I think, obvious reasons. What would you, what would you suggest what, what, what is different about Credit Suisse that they would voluntarily commit ahead of time to avoid a situation where, the, where they would have the investors bail them out versus a free bailout from the government? Well, ju just to be clear, we haven't done this yet. You need a fair amount of help from supervisors and regulators to get there, but we'd like to get there. Mm -hmm. And we've certainly done the COCOs first, uh, which is sort of a halfway step in this direction. Uh, but to get to bail-in, we're going to need some help from our government and from some other governments to make this implementable. I would say that at least our institution, there are a number of other institutions here, worked very hard. Uh, we, um, when, uh, when some of the banks were under attack, we had to work very hard not to take government money and to make sure that we protected ourselves, got new capital in very short spans of time. Um, I think actually long-term, that's valuable for our franchise. It was not easy to do. It was not cheap. But I think that in a small country like Switzerland, where everybody knows everybody else, um, that uh, being responsible for your own problems is important, and they'll remember that. So I think for us, that's, a, that's important as a long-term strategic value. And I'd say there have also been some American firms. Uh, JP Morgan has advocated uh, some similar things for trying to figure out how you can make a large American bank failable. They say they shouldn't be too big to fail. We should solve this problem. Because I do think it's fundamental in all this list of reform. If we can't solve this, we will rightfully be subject to a lot of other very difficult regulatory and other challenges. I think this is a cleaner way to get there. <laughs> 
a, a follow-on question to Mike Klausner's knock-on contagion effect. I wonder if the, the contagion problem isn't so much a question of counterparty exposure, but a question of opacity in the markets and the markets getting spooked. So if you've got the first triggering event that occurs with the first SIPI, then in light of the fact that the balance sheets are going to be so opaque, what's to stop uh, investors from from fleeing the equity of other of other uh, contingently capitalized mm -hmm. entities and then causing a cascading triggering effect. So the analogy not between Goldman and AIG necessarily, but Goldman and Lehman. Mm -hmm. So um, what's to stop that from happening here? Well, one of the things we try to do here is to, you know, protect the runnable classes, and the exchange all happens to people who can't run. If you own long-term debt, you can't run. You can sell, but you can't run. You can't actually find a way to just dump your asset for par and go put it somewhere else like you can with a money fund or something else. <clears throat> so by protecting the classes of runnable counterparties, I think that, that will significantly reduce some of the panic incentives that were real in the last crisis. Secondly, for the people that have those long-term debt ownership positions, if you can reduce the amount of loss they have, uh, and if you get, give them a package of things that even in a distressed market might be worth 80 to 90 cents in the dollar and the debt was trading there anyway, you might say, well, wait a minute, I'll take my chances. Compare that to what we had last time when you were saying there's either a merger or there's disaster, and if you're a risk-averse debt investor, that's a bad thing to hold. If I can give you a much softer landing, uh, I think that's much less destabilizing, even on the investor front. Uh, hey, hey, Wilson, uh, contractual versus statutory, what are the issues? How do you feel on that? Okay, this is a, an important technical question between do you build a regime like this by having a statutory regime like Dodd-Frank parachute in on top and make this happen through force of law, or do you force institutions to say, I want you guys to issue a lot of contractual bonds um, like the Swiss system, you know, maybe even the Swiss system plus something, that do this through the use of contractual instruments. I would argue that the, the most efficient version of this is something that uh, Clifford Chance uh, recently put out a, a pretty big article on this um, that's called the hybrid system. It's statutory in your home country, but a number of us fund in many other jurisdictions. And one of the issues is even if you've got bail-in in your home country, how would that apply to funding in the UK, in Switzerland, in South Africa or wherever you fund. And so you need to have some contractual tie into other funding vehicles. If you fund a lot through a third party jurisdiction, you'd need that tie in to make it work for a large global SIFI. But the, by going through that approach, I think you solve the biggest legal problem to this challenge, which has been one of the things that people have brought up. They said, well, this would work great if you were just a domestic bank, but it can't possibly work for an international firm. And I think this hybrid approach is the way that you actually adapt it for a firm that like most of the GCIFIs, um, that, it, that operates heavily both in the home market and a number of other international markets. Thank you. Thanks, Carol.